the F-22 Raptor, F-35 Lightning II, and other Western fifth-generation fighters are impressive machines designed to counter today's threat with stealth and sensor fusion, among other features. But have you ever wondered, what's next? What happens when our adversaries' speed, maneuverability, reach, and lethality reach parity with, or even exceed, our own, as inevitably happens in the perpetual race of arms? Well, that's what's in store for you this week, here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello and welcome to episode 149. I am your host, Jello, and this week we are discussing the future of air warfare. Now, you have probably noticed on recent episodes that I've had some help with the interviews, and this week is more of the same, except it's not a past guest like Ken Katz or Billy Flynn. It's my friend and former F-14 Rio turned F-A-18 Wizzo, Matt Arney. Flounder, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jello. It is really great to be here with you on the Fighter Pilot Podcast. I'm excited. Well, I am as well. Now, our Patreon supporters have met you. We had you on for a recent happy hour. But for everyone else, just give us a quick summary. Who is Flounder? Yeah. So, Jello, you know, our flying days go back to CAG-1. Over my career in the Navy, I accumulated about 3,000 hours and a little over 700 traps and enjoyed a lot of experiences along the way. I did some test tours. I did some ship tours, assistant navigator, operations officer. I did a couple embassy tours. Ultimately, I had command of the Black Knights of VFA 154, and I finished up my time out here at Whidbey Island outside of Seattle, where I was the commanding officer. So I recently retired, residing in the Seattle area, and just enjoying life out here. Well, that's fantastic. And you come from a bit of a dynasty. I worked for your brother, Skip. Your father, Wayne, has reached out to the show, and I think, was he also an aviator? He was. He was an F-4 pilot in the 60s and 70s, uh, Vietnam era, all that good stuff. All right. So for anyone else who's interested, head over to patreon.com, search for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and look for the happy hour. I think it was number 30 or 31 with Flounder, where you can get some background on us and find out why sometimes we'll just randomly say to each other, eh? Eh? (laughs) (laughs) It's funny to us. Everybody else thinks we're idiots. But (laughs) well, hey, glad to have your help. And we'll get to your interview with Pink in a little bit. But first, some quick announcements and a couple listener questions. Now, for those of you who will be or plan to be in the San Diego area at the end of September, you should attend the Miramar Air Show the last weekend of the month. It's always a great show, particularly with the MAGTAF demo and all the other acts. I plan to be there Saturday, September 24th. In fact, I'll be hanging out at the Devil Dog Alley Chalet most of the day. So if you want to come rub elbows with me and some past guests and even a few Patreon supporters who I already know will be there, well then jump on miramarairshow.com. Pick up your ticket for Saturday for the Devil Dog Alley Chalet, and we'll see you there. And I'll probably uh, escape the chalet and go to some various static displays at different times, and we'll update everybody on that later on. All right, there's other things I can ramble about, but we'll keep it quick. Flounder, you got any announcements? I know this is your first time on the show and all, but... Yeah, so out here in Seattle, we got the Seattle Seafair coming up this week. Blue Angels are going to be performing 5th through 7th of August, so I'm going to be out there. We got a Blue Angels brunch I'm going to do, and... I'll be out enjoying some of the seafarer festivities. And then right around the corner, we got Hook Jello. I know. I will be there. September is going to be crazy busy because the Reno Air Races, they want me to come up and hang out with them as well. So I've got like three weekends in a row planned. So hopefully my airline won't mind if I, <laughs> uh, I may have to. <laughs> anyway, you get the point. Wait, you're out of the Navy. You find a job? Come on there, slacker. Well, it's been great doing a sabbatical for a while. I really enjoyed it. As you know, my boys are younger, so doing a lot of Cub Scouts and youth sports and all those kinds of things while I figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah. But I did establish my own consulting firm called CAS Enterprise Management. Obviously, it has a nice ring of close air support, but it's got other connotations to it. Mm -hmm. But I did find a job. So I just accepted an offer and I'll be starting in the middle of September, the Monday after hook with the Arnold Group Oh boy, out here, which is a Seattle-based consulting firm for technology and software companies. So I'm really looking forward to those adventures coming up. 
Oh, I bet. Well, as I've always said on this show, people in our line of work tend to end up on their feet pretty well, I would say, after their careers. I agree with you. Cool. I will say we end up on our feet thanks to a lot of the great veteran service organizations out there, Oh, which I took full advantage of. A lot of great people helping us out. No, that's true. And that's a good plug for them. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it takes a lot of individual effort, but in the end, everything we did on the carrier and with our families and everything else, it's all a team activity. Well, tell you what, let's grab a couple listener questions to try to clear out and then we'll get to the interview. Let's start with an email from Corey who says, I listened to the F-14 TomCast episode about the barricade and a comment was made about having to make a night trap every five days to maintain currency. That made me curious about other currency requirements for military pilots. And I thought of a few questions which might be of interest to your listeners, especially young people considering a career as a military aviator. I'm slowly working towards my private pilot license, so I'm familiar with currency requirements, such as having to make three landings in the last 90 days to carry passengers. But what are the requirements for currency for fighter pilots? If you're on deployment, I suspect it normally isn't hard to maintain currency, but if you can't fly for a week due to sickness or something and haven't been able to get a night trap in more than five days, how do you regain currency? Do you have to fly night traps with another pilot? And how would you do that if your primary aircraft is something like an FA-18C or F-35. Now, Corey has more parts, but let's pause here because there's a lot to unpack already. So, Corey, when we are ashore, we have various requirements for currency, even just based on the missions we're going to go do. So, if we're going to go dogfight or do low-altitude training or night close air support or even just a regular night flight, then we have to have flown within so many preceding days and in some cases have so many flights or so many hours. And then even just basic flying currency, if you haven't flown for a couple of weeks, either because you were on some other uh, assignment or you were sick or something else, then there's weather requirements. You might have to do an immediate action exam. You might even have to go jump in the simulator. And if it's been too long, you might have to go all the way up to a NATOPS check again. And I think that's something like six months. So it really just is a function of how recent it's been since you flew. Now on the carrier, Flounder, help me out here. He said five days. I don't know if maybe they misspoke on the TomCast or maybe he misheard, but wasn't it seven days? Right. Seven days is what I remember. Okay. And so your question is a good one, Corey, because both Flounder and I, well, first off, you had currency requirements even as a Rio and a Wizzo, if I remember correctly. We did. They weren't as stringent. Matter of fact, if you go back to our happy hour, we talk about that when I was off the boat for like three weeks right. doing some other stuff and could come right back in, right into a combat mission. So it was easier for us. Well, even I jumped off the boat for a while to be the liaison and they usually kind of balance that with currency because when you come back, they'll just make sure that you have a day flight first and you might even get a touch and go just so the LSOs can get a second look at you kind of thing. Make sure you're you know, there. And during that, you'll have certain weather and sometimes sea state requirements. Plus, if it's particularly long, maybe, I don't know, I can't remember if it's over a week, you might even have to have a divert requirement. But you have to go day before you go night. And then if it's been too long, I mean, if you really did get sick or let's say you're in a staff position and you just hadn't flown in a month or two, well, then you might have to FCLP again. And if that happens and you're in the middle of deployment, you're probably done flying for the rest of it. They typically don't let that happen to squadron pilots, but for the staff weenies, again, they think they're going to fly and then they get busy with the Admiral or whatever. Yeah, that's really why we made sure guys like you, when you went off to be a liaison, you had to be back by 30 days because that was the limit where we had to start doing FCLPs. That's right. And then we don't ever, God forbid, duel up at sea, even in uh, the F squadrons that uh, Flounder was part of. We go day before night, and I wouldn't necessarily want to jump in the backseat of somebody. I was never an FRS instructor, so and even they generally send students solo for the first time. Now, that's a good question, but he keeps going here, Flounder. I'm going to put his next two questions to you because I bet you can uh, handle these for me. Civilian pilots, he says, need a biannual flight review from a CFI. I guess that's a certified flight instructor. What sort of annual slash regular flight reviews do you need in the military? I know, Jello, you've mentioned on the show something about periodic NATOPS checks. Yeah, and certainly, and we mentioned that a little earlier in this. I also have been a private pilot with instrument ratings, so I'm familiar with those. But on the Navy side, we need that annual NATOPS check, which is going to, and I can't remember exactly what NATOPS stands for, but it's a check that's designed to make sure that you are following the emergency procedures the way they should be and testing crew coordination, not only in a two-place cockpit, but maybe with a wingman. We can simulate that with the console operator 
and the squadron duty officer, all that kind of stuff, the crew coordination and the procedural compliance all gets tested and just the head work, making sure you got the head work right to work through challenging situations. So that's one. And then the other one's the instrument check that you're familiar with the instrument procedures, that you're able to do those instrument procedures during different kind of instrument approaches and level flight and unusual attitudes and all that kind of stuff. If we need to, we can put those two into one, but it's really better to do those as two separate events. And then the other thing we do, because we deploy for six, nine months, we have to do them every 12 months. So before you go on deployment, even if you've done it five, six months ago, you're going to do it again so we can make sure that you're current all the way through the deployment. And then we'll start getting ahead of the problem when we get back. So if I remember correctly, Flounder, Naval Aviation Training and Operations Procedures Standardization. That sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and in accordance with that, you'll also have some exams to take open and closed book before you go through that simulator. And then same for the instrument check, you'll have, I think, what is it, a half a day or a full day of instrument ground school. And it's just a refresher plus an update on what's new. Yeah, it's just a good way That's right. to uh, just make sure every year you're brushed up on all these things. And typically you don't see any failures in this. I mean, if the person is struggling on an ATOPS or an instrument check, it's probably already brought to the attention of people who are watching that young pilot or Wizzo. So yeah, that's generally not something you fail. That's right. All right. Last question from Corey. Civilian pilots also need to renew their medical certificate every six months to five years, depending on age and class. To your point, Corey, I have a class one and I have to get it every six months and I'm over 50. But Flounder, how frequently do military pilots have to get medicals? We've got to do it every year. We do it around our birth month. Yep. That's something you can do at sea on the aircraft carriers. We've got the ability to do that. You have to do audiology. You have to do blood work. You have to do you know, all those kind of different elements just to make sure you're still in good health and can continue flying in that physiological environment that we operate in. Well, and you missed one when you check into a new squadron, it's not a full physical, but they'll yeah. check you out and say, Hey, any changes, anything going on? Sometimes they'll give you a quick look over, which I haven't told the fighter pilot podcast world, my story yet, but that's where I got tripped up. And someday when I reveal that, uh, I'll give all the details, but yeah, I was checking in and took a look at me and found something they didn't like. And the rest, as they say, is history that we'll talk about another time. All right. Thanks again, Corey. I hope that answers your questions. Next, let's take a phone call. Hey, Jello. Matt Tim here, calling from Fairfax, Virginia. I was wondering if you guys are planning on doing an episode on the MH-53 Pavlo. I know you guys say that all the planes and every helicopter is on the list, but the cool ones are higher up. I think this is one of the cool ones. The uh, Air Force's like, special operations helicopter who retired in 2000 and replaced by the Osprey. My dad flew him for a while, and I think it's the coolest helicopter ever made. So uh, love your show. Been listening to it for a while now. All right, Matt, thanks for your question. You're right. We did cover the CH-53, but we could certainly revisit the MH-53 pave loads. Different story and different use. And the limiting factor for really any aircraft series episode is always finding a good guest with extensive experience and compelling stories and the ability to tell them. So if that describes your dad and you want to have him reach out to the show, we'll see what we can do. All right. Next is an email from Jan in Germany. He says, in the civilian world, airliners transition between different QNH or altimeter settings. How does the Navy do it when operating from the carrier? Same as civilian aviation? Or do you operate under a single altimeter setting? Or is the answer, it depends? Now, Flounder, you're relatively new to the show, but I bet you get a chuckle out of that one because <laughs> we use that quite often. But on this one, I think we can pretty much tell you there, Yan, that we will have the altimeter setting briefed as part of the meteorology portion of the event brief before we go flying on that one. And normally, when I got in the jet, Flounder, I don't know about you, I just dialed the altimeter to read 60 feet because That's that was right. typically the height of the flight deck. And then I just left it there for the entire hop. Now, when you come back on case one, everything you're doing around the ship is mostly with the radar altimeter anyway. So if the altimeter changed, it doesn't matter because you're using your rad out. And then in case two and case three, Marshall will provide the altimeter when you're in holding. And then as you're coming down above 5,000 and you hit platform, as we call it, then you make sure you have the rad out to the HUD and everything after that is radar altimeter. So not a big deal, but I don't remember when we flew into Iraq, Flounder, did we have to like set it to 2992 at that point or did it matter? Well, I mean, I recall still setting it to 2992 when we got above 18,000, at least that's what I'm remembering. And so then as we were flying up at the higher altitudes, we were on that standard altimeter setting. Yeah. But then 
you could get a local altimeter setting for your operating area if you were working, say, in the range in Egypt or over in country in Iraq, Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, if we were just doing, let's say, you and I, a 2v2 with a ship in the middle of the ocean, I don't remember necessarily setting it to 2992 if we went up high, but maybe I was screwed up. But I think in the end, the point is the stuff we're doing is not so precise that we're worried about 10 or 20 feet or whatever the difference might be. I mean, it could be more of obviously, but you know, we've got training rules for air to air engagements and we've got other sea and avoid type stuff. So it generally wasn't a big deal. I didn't think. Yeah, that's right. As long as we knew within the flight, we had the same setting and that we have so many great systems backing us up nowadays on altitude. But yeah, it was an important thing to understand in the flight. All right. Finally, I have a delightful phone call that isn't really a question so much as a comment or a series of comments. So stick around after the flyby at the end of this episode to hear that one. And thank you, Catherine, for the kind words and sharing your interesting experiences and best wishes to your husband. All right. Well, without further delay, then let's move to our feature interview. And Flounder, what made you want to discuss the future of air warfare and how did you find today's guest? Well, Jello, it really goes back to our initial conversations about me even coming onto the show and my fascination with future technologies and those kinds of things. As I go back in my career, as you come out of your JO tour, you really have basically three options. You have an option to be a RAG instructor, go to Top Gun and enjoy that program with Top Gun or the weapons schools, or you go into the test community. And so I was a guy who decided back in my stash ensign tour at VX4 that I really liked what those guys did out there. And I wanted to be a part of that test community, developing new technologies. And I maintained that theme throughout my career whenever I could. So as I thought, and I've listened to a lot of the content, haven't listened to all the shows yet, but still working through them. A lot of great stuff that the Fighter Pilot Podcast does, but I really started thinking about, well, let's take a forward looking view of all this and see where we think things are going to go and bring in people who are really involved in trying to determine that. That's what I did. And and I was talking with a good friend of mine, Rick Arthur. You'll hear about this in the interview with Pink. He runs the Fleet Writers Room. He's got a surface warfare background. He went off to be a screenwriter, you know, script writer in Hollywood. Hmm. And so he brought that to the Navy to help try to conceptualize what the future of air warfare is going to get. So he connected me with Pink. And I think that this interview really hit the mark for me because I really wanted to provide a good context for that future of air warfare and allow all kinds of rabbit holes that we can go down on future episodes. No doubt. All right. Well, then let's get to it with our guest, retired U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander Lance Floyd. Here we go. Hey, Pink. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Appreciate you coming on. Really excited about the topic today. We're going to talk about air combat in the 2040s. So a mutual friend of ours connected us and uh, or reconnected us, I should say, and I was able to catch up with you and your background. So before we get into the topic, let's talk about who you are and where you're from and introduce you to the listeners. So what's your background, Pink? Where'd you grow up? Awesome. Thanks for having me. So I guess I come from a sordid past, you know, um, officer and a gentleman, AOCS, I never met Luke Gossett, but you know, I had the same sort of torture introduction to the United States Navy in Pensacola, Florida, where I did not know how hot it could possibly be. But that's kind of the middle of the story, I guess. Before that, grew up in Virginia Beach, son of a Navy A6 pilot, actually, Butch Bailey. He got me interested in the whole thing. As a teenager, I was convinced I wanted to be an astronaut, so why not join the Navy? I went to uh, University of Texas got a degree in aerospace because it seemed more important than just aero. The space was something must be, right, to get you hmm. the extra hump to get over the hump. And then went off to Pensacola, uh, did that business, and I was commissioned in uh, 1988, October. I got my first choice and I ended up going to um, do my jet training out in Beeville. And for those that are listening, I have no idea what that is. It used to be a training base in Texas. And That's right. And it was awesome. Another hot place. Flew uh, the T2 and A4s. And again, uh, did well enough to get my first choice. I was winged in 88. Went to Cecil Field in uh, early 1990, I guess. So I was in Cecil Field to fly F-18s at 106. Finished up the rag and got the call to go to Desert Storm, right? You know, I'm Mm -hmm. barely a JG. I went through the pipeline really fast. Now I was joined the, the Kestrels, the FA-137, and we were 
slated to go and join the rest of the party at Desert Storm, got halfway across the Atlantic, and they turned us home. I said, by the time you show up, this thing's going to be over. So, Oh, my goodness. Ended up back on cruise, and away we go from there. Career-wise, uh, I did a J.O. tour with the Kestrels. I was lucky enough to get picked up for Top Gun along the way. Did the power projection course in 93-ish time frame, and then got selected to go to test pilot school. So you did Top Gun and test pilot school? Yeah, so one of the unique few, I guess. All of the Top Gun guys today would say I didn't go to the real course. Mm. You know, the Miramar course was not nearly as challenging. As we're recording this, we've just been through the Top Gun month. So there's some great episodes about the history of Top Gun. So you went through in the middle of your first tour and then came back to your squadron yeah. before they transitioned to the eight-week course. Yeah, so it's very different than it is today. You went and you came back and you were labeled a training officer, but it wasn't the same mm. as today where you're actually trained to be a training officer. So the power projection course was uh, six weeks. It was a bit of um, kind of like AOCS. It was more of an evaluation than it was a teaching moment, it felt like, most of the time. Mm -hmm. I showed up. I had just gotten my division qual, so I was not really prepared for it. And uh, we just come off a cruise, and we were kind of in some downtime. And we hadn't been preparing for the threat, the former Soviet threat, and the problem. So I didn't know all my numbers, and, and I showed up you know, well behind the power curve. But managed to survive and uh, finish up well. I did not win the Top Gun trophy because, uh, <laughs> as we all know, it doesn't exist. Yeah. My name is it on a plaque, though, somewhere up in uh, Fallon. So I actually went and looked at my picture. I go, that guy looks really young. Yeah, that's right. The funny thing, I was uh, with Gramps Leaning. You might know Gramps. Oh, yeah, I think so. In Whidbey Island world. Yeah. Speaking of Whidbey Island, so Butch is still up here in Whidbey Island, right? Yeah, so he retired and he lives up in. Uh, Him and Barbara are doing great stuff in the community. You know, his tour got him uh, up there as the CEO of the FRS and then um, as the Commodore. So that they'd made the FRS a major command at that time. So he was an 06 FRS CEO and Commodore. And then went out. His last job was the OPSO for Sweepy Island. Mm -hmm. So the CNAV job switched back and forth back in those days. So he was in Norfolk back then. So Yeah. So they lived in the house, the flag quarters on... But beyond, did you live in that house? No, I visited. So by the time they were there, I was off on my own uh, journey, right? So yeah, I was done with college. I was actually uh, in the Navy by then. Because that's where my family lived in that house when I was a uh, commanding officer out there. It's a great place. But anyway, that's completely off track. I'd love to have Butch on for a happy hour <laughs> someday. So where we left you was mid-tour on the Kestrels. You've been to Top Gun. Yeah. You're a tactician on top of the world as a J.O. coming out of Top Gun, and you decided to go test pilot. So how did that come about? No, that's a great way of putting it, right? So on top of the world, right? You're flying everybody else's airplane. I mean, that's just the way it goes, right? <laughs> and then I went off to do the test pilot gig, and I was lucky enough to get selected for the co-op program. So I went straight to Monterey and went to grad school, which was uh, yet another shock in the, just the training all that you signed up to be kind of thing. So, you know, you got to go to stupid studies and relearn how to do differential equations and, you know, vector calculus and holy cow goes on and on. So I went there and I got my master's in aero at the completion of test pilot school. So you go and do some coursework and everything effectively, but a thesis and then test pilot school counts as a thesis. I think it's probably easier to do the thesis than this other way, but Mm. But it's not as fun. You don't get to fly as many platforms. <laughs> right. Yeah. So test pilot school was a real hoot, right? I flew 24 different kind of aircraft, including, you know, helicopters and gliders and uh, Andover and Hawks and F-16s. And uh, it just goes on and on. That was a great opportunity. I will not lie, though. It was hard. We used to have the joke, you'd spend half the day preparing for flights for the next day, half of the day doing academics, and then half a day studying for tests and somewhere near the math. <laughs> a lot of divorces out of that schoolhouse, but yeah. it's probably a different story. What did you do for your, uh, what do they call it, kind of the final where you go out? The DT2? Yeah. DT2. So I flew the Jaguar in England. That must be some sort of a uh, widower platform. Mm, a widowmaker. 
remarkable that they actually call that a platform. It, it's some kind of lifting vehicle, but only in a straight line, right? So <laughs> above 14 alpha, it departs and develops a flat spin and flies out to sea and goose in your back seat, right? So it's a horrific thing. You have to turn off the ECS to take off in full afterburner on a 12,000 foot runway. Wow. With two drop tanks, right? So I heard it only flies great below 100 feet. At 100 feet, and it's a laser bomber. It's an awesome bombing system. For the Hornet drivers out there, it's a CCIP kind of thing Mm. where you just follow the little X on the ground and hit the pickle when it's required. And CCIP for our listeners, computer calculated impact point. Yeah. And I actually, here's a funny bit of trivia. My family history is from Wales. Uh, I've got an, an old aunt that said the last king of Wales was a Floyd. I have to look up to verify that, but we went to a bombing range in Wales. So I took off from uh, next to Stonehenge and then flew over to Wales to do the bombing run. But while I was there, I got to fly the Andover, which is like a C-130 kind of thing. And the Hawk, which was a real blast. Uh, so the Goss Hawk that they're flying in training command. The T-45. It's the better version of that airplane. So we put all these draggy things on it for the Navy. Over there, they fly it slick, and it is an awesome glider. So it does make a lot of lift, Mm. and you can do these high-altitude approaches. And I got to fly the Gazelle, which is a little small helicopter that the instructor asked me. So you you flown a little helicopter? He's like, yeah, yeah. He says, what's different about British helicopters? I I don't know. The rotor goes a different way. I go, oh, I knew that. We learned about that. Well, what does that mean to you? I don't know. Well, which pedal do you push? And I said, the one that makes me go straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not get complicated here. Oh, that's funny. So you graduate test pilot school and then you go into your test tour. Did you stay at PAX or did you go out to China Lake? I stayed at PAX River. I got uh, sort of recruited to go to PAX and it was Strike back then instead of VX23 or 21. I was a carrier suit guy. So as an LSO in the fleet, there's like a triple qual. Yeah, wait a minute, Pink. You were LSO, Top Gun graduate, and co-op program. Yeah. Amazing. You squeezed everything out of... I got it all. ...your career. You know, and I figured somewhere in there, an Alan Shepard had done the same thing, right? You know, I just got to follow in somebody's footsteps, right? Mm. So the uh, Pax River work was very exciting. So carrier suitability is awesome. There's the ship side of it where you got to certify their systems. And so a lot of landings, a lot of mode ones, for those that don't know that a fully automated coupled approach in the F-18, the legacy platform did very, very well, uh, believe it or not. And you had to make sure that all the optical systems were working right and the radars and all that. So in that case, you're flying a known aircraft against a maybe not well-known ship system to make sure the ship system is working right. Mm-hmm. And then on the other end, I was lucky enough to be one of the original group that flew the Super Hornet. We got to go and take the Super Hornet to the ship to do follow on sea trials, which was a lot of fun. And like we talked about prior to starting the recording, I'm credited with the first night arrested landing in the Super Hornet. So I don't know that that is even on the plaque anywhere, but I have the hook for it to prove it. You got the hook point around. We were talking about your colleague in that, Spanky Morley. Yeah. As well. Yeah, it's a small world. So Spanky and I sat in cubes next to each other for a little while, and then he took off to do other things. Spanky got the first arrested landing in the Super Hornet. Amazing test pilot. uh, One of the brightest guys I ever met. The funny thing about Spanky is he left us to go off and do a Super J.O. Navigator's job. Yeah, he was an assistant navigator on Enterprise because I ended up coming in two people behind him. And then we had a mutual friend. So that's how we got connected for my half time on Enterprise as well. So I teased him relentlessly about going to do a, a shoe job, but it was obvious that he was on a fast track. So by the time he left Pax River, he was on his way to his department head tour. He had already deep selected for command mm-hmm. and he hadn't even started his department head tour. So that tells you a little bit about Spanky Morley, so. Yeah, great guy. I hope he doesn't watch this so he hears us talking about how great he is. But <laughs> <laughs> So you do the test tour, got some great Super Hornet development and carrier suit, and then what happened next? Then there's all the, the big Navy payback, right? Mm. Congratulations on winning the lottery. Now you got to go to Japan. You know, I had three daughters at the time, and my youngest 
was only six months old. They said, pack your trash, you're going to Japan. And that man, I fought that thing with everything I had. Tried to claim, you know, asthma. You know, at the time they had the Shinthampu incinerator and all. So, I, you know, I was, I was pulling everything I could out, but sucked up and did it. Joined the uh, world, fa- the super shit hot world famous Golden Dragons of BFA 192 and had the best tour of my life. It was awesome. Mm-hmm. I would recommend anybody that has an opportunity to go to Japan, don't fight it go and have a great time because it's the most operational flying I've ever done, right? It is continuous. You're never outside of a day night window that requires more than two day and one night traps or something to get you back in the saddle for CQ. So it was awesome. They may have changed since then, but no, right. back in the day, even on the shitty kitty, it was a great tour. Yeah, I think there are front line out there and the Reagan are maintaining all that readiness they need to out there. And yeah, I think that carries true today. So you do the department head. So where do we get to the transition to being an engineer at China Lake? How did that happen? Well, that's sort of a happy, unhappy story. I wanted to get back to test. I was actually slated to go do the job at Nellis for the listeners to know about that, there's a Navy test pilot job that you're based out of Nellis, work for VX9. It's pretty cool. You get to go to really cool, um, super secret places and fly super secret aircraft. And then I got sort of aced out of that. And now it's in the short hairs. And what do I do? And they said, well, you can go to China Lake. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. I don't want to go to China Lake. But there it was. There were no other options. And I showed up and they actually didn't hire me for a test gig, right? So I wasn't hired effectively put in a test pilot billet. I was the opso for the squadron. Mm. For me, it worked out. It turns out that if you're competent in what you do, you, you get to do things. So I ended up doing a lot of work there. I was one of the original AESA pilots for APG-79. So got a lot of uh, APG-79 time. For those that don't know it, that's the phased array radar that's in the Super Hornet. Pretty cool. VX-9 or VX-31? 31. Okay. And then the sad part of the story, which uh, it's embarrassing to talk about, but it's part of my life. Uh, I got a DUI uh, right about that point. I had a NASA package in. I was all set. You know, I didn't talk about it before, but I actually got an interview in 1999. Mm. They picked 17 for that class, and I was number 22 in 1999. So it was that close. I knew everybody down there in Houston and somewhat of a political game. So I was working it actively. I had a really good package in and I got the DUI and they pulled my package back. So my NASA days were over and it turns out so were my Navy career uh, effectively. I had already selected for 05, but hadn't pinned it on when they did a review because I hadn't pinned it on yet. You know, it came back around and I had a fish five and, uh, and it was a bad story. So at one point, my mom, who's married to Butch Bailey, um, knew uh, Vernon Clark. It was CNO at the time. I actually got to talk to him and and he said, uh, we don't promote for past performance, but future potential and your son doesn't have any. So mm. it's a pretty sad moment for a guy that was, you know, I, you know, I'm all in. Yeah. Superstar. Yeah. Now I'm not all in. So now I'm the terminal 04 dirtbag, but it still worked out. You know, people and you're good at what you do. And that's not bragging. That's just, you know, the nature of the business. Turns out I had some friends that helped me out and I ended up doing my final tour at VX9 as the ace uh, OTD. So I took the APG-79 to OpiBow, which was way cool uh, to get that radar fielded. I loved using it out there in the fleet too. So I appreciate everything you guys did. It was an amazing system. So you finished up there and you retire and you're feeling kind of blue, maybe a little sorry for yourself. And I ended up picking up a contractor gig to do some, those that know contract support services, you're effectively a consultant analyst kind of person. They're in China Lake with a group called the Advanced Systems IPT. With my engineering background, all the test pilot expertise, and then uh, the Top Gun tactics background, it was a, a natural progression for me to become somewhat of a translator and an assessor of kill chains. So engineers maybe that don't understand why they do what they do with the kill chain and then to the decision makers, what works and what doesn't work. I joined a team, we were called HiCap at the time, horizontal integration, capabilities assessment process. 
And that had been stood up by N98, for those that don't know, OPNAV Aviation Resources, to have an independent assessment team with support from NAVAIR. And away we went. So back then I was working with Dan Lipper Lee and um, Daisy Dukes, Marine, Kevin Wolf, Wolfie, but I can throw out a whole bunch of names of people there that may know. And yeah. So we were doing a kill chain analysis work. And that was exciting. I cut over to the government after a couple of years. There was an opportunity. So now I'm a government service employee. While I was there, I, I noticed they had these um, F-18 like tubs, you know, more than a desktop, less than a cockpit, similar to what they fly in St. Louis. And those that have been there wouldn't know what I'm talking about. I said, what are those things? And they said, well, they're here. Boeing gave them to us and we haven't quite figured out what we're going to do with them. And I said, well, do they fly? Yes, they do. The long story, very short, is we pulled those things, dusted them off, and over the years built an operator in the loop environment, where today we have uh, 14 F-18s, 8 F-35, 2 E-2 in a box, a reconfigurable cockpit, AFSIM with a lot of flexibility to model the current day and the future. Mm-hmm. And we bring in operators and do trade space, condoms development, all that. If I wanted to put a plaque on the wall, I would say on the extreme, we were very much instrumental in the selection and requirements process for a few weapons, some that are still classified. Mm -hmm. A lot of the sensor improvements that you're seeing on the Super Hornet today on one end and then the other end, we trained uh, CAG-2 for the first deployment, Mm. integrated air wing with F-35s. Yeah, with the F-A-147. What's yeah, thirty five. Yeah, that is very cool, and it's a great place for us to kind of really push further out in the future. Now you got a tremendous background, tactics, platform development, and you started creating this agile system that you guys could kind of iterate through what challenges might be out there. So as you think about the twenty forties, what comes to your mind as far as the challenges that we face as uh, in war fighting in the twenty forties? Yeah. So, you know, to talk about the future, you kind of have to talk about the gaps today. So without crossing any classification lines and all that sort of things, you know, based you know a lot of open source material and things that are kind of intuitive, there are what we traditionally call near peer threats. Well, I can tell you they're peer threats. And in some cases, they have an advantage, a distinct advantage, right? So China being one, you can read about it. Some of the technology that we've invested in over the years, like an F-35 and some stealth technology, those platforms were built around a requirement that was very much based in a former Soviet Union threat. So a lot of the things that we did to make those aircraft very survivable against a Soviet Union threat, turns out the Chinese either figured it out or they stole the secrets or whatever, but they figured out ways to counter that. That's hugely problematic because we built an entire inventory and an acquisition posture around taking advantage of their vulnerabilities in our sanctuary. And it turns out the sanctuary has basically evaporated. So now we're toe to toe. I know I would say we still have more advanced sensors. We got better pilots, you know, and I'm not going to give any of that away. But when it comes to platform v platform, and you start comparing numbers, you know, in kinematics, as an example, their weapons go farther than our weapons. And you could say, well, maybe that doesn't matter. Well, it does matter if you see each other at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts getting really, really hard. You know, how do you get past that? That doesn't even take into account the whole capacity thing that you can't possibly present from a Navy perspective, the, the numbers that the adversary can. So if you don't win decisively early, if you don't have a tremendous exchange ratio advantage, it's just a matter of time. You're basically painting the picture of an aircraft carrier and a strike group, an air wing sitting off the coast, can't generate the capacity of somebody coming from their own territory. Yeah, it's a tough problem, right? You know, if there's 3,000 of them and there's 20 of you, just do the math, right? At some point, it, something breaks. So even when you bring in the joint partners and you know, Raptor comes to save the day and there's not a lot of Raptors. And it turns out all the things I talked about F-35, well, they probably apply to Raptors. So there's just a lot of ways that the playing field has been leveled, right? Mm -hmm. In air combat. 
and air to ground or strike or surface to surface and all that, it's even more disparate, right? We're talking in some cases, order of magnitude when it comes to a kinetic advantage, weapon yes. systems that eclipse ours remarkably, right? So for those that are listening and then what a harpoon is, right? And an F-18 carrying a harpoon, right? Or an F-18 carrying a J-style C-1, a glide weapon. Everybody is fairly familiar with the ranges of those weapons. Well, when I go against the adversary, that their equivalent weapon, a power flight goes 10 times as much. That's a problem. Mm-hmm. How do you do that? So knowing all that, where do you go from here? Do you invest in more stealth? You know, at some point, there's a DC to light spectrum out there. And at some point, there are places that you just can't be invisible in all spectrum. So do you make those investments? Well, in some cases, probably so. There's uh, opportunities to improve upon the original concepts, right? The survivability technologies that are in, you know, an F-35 or an F-22, they're not new, right? They're Mm -hmm. old. And in some cases, date back into the 80s, right? So Obviously, there's materials improvements. There are a number of things that can be done. And and in in the classified world, even more stuff. But at some point, you just can't hide forever. So it looks like the next generation air dominance options include not only more survivability, but include performance, which for all the fighter pilots out there, that's pretty exciting. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to pull 10 Gs, but it does mean you're probably going to go very fast. It turns out very fast is kind of a lifesaver. When I look at a threat weapon system that only goes further than mine, but goes faster than mine, I can neutralize that fairly quickly when I can employ from high speed, high altitude, and then run away smartly very, very fast. Mm -hmm. That allows you to close the gap a little bit on the kinetic problem. Yeah. Dealing, like you said, with what we had, we knew that getting fast and getting high would give us the longest stick we could get. But as we think about a faster platform delivering some kind of kinetic weapon, you need to be able to see way out there so that you have the decision space and then you can engage. Obviously in Top Gun, he's trying to go Mach 10 in Top Gun Maverick, but whatever it is, that means a big turning radius too, so you can then run away bravely. It's a very complex problem we got to work through. Yeah, it is. And uh, on the sensor side, The future is the idea of a a single aircraft autonomous kill chain is going to become a thing of the past. And any brave patch wearing fighter pilot is going to deny that uh, vehemently. Even I would stand up in a room amongst my peers and say, and that can't be the truth. We can't ever have it that way. But we're bumping up against physics. You know, at some point, the curvature of the earth starts to become a real problem, right? So you saying the earth is not flat? The earth is not flat. Last <laughs> I checked. So and that goes into the calculus, right? If anybody wants to know, you know, it's 1.23 times the square root of the height, the minus the height, whatever. But so to be geeky, but when you're working with those limitations and the amount of power that you can put out, and the fact that to have long range active kill chains means that you have to be active. And when you're active, you become vulnerable. There are systems that detect active sensors, right? And I think everyone accepts that. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing an all passive fight, well, how well do your sensors perform passively? You know, there's infrared spectrum, there's the RF spectrum. RF requires that the other guy emit something. And if it doesn't emit in the frequency band that's advantageous to you or that you can detect, then it's effectively not emitting, right? So you know, it gets really, really complicated. And in the IR spectrum, weather and atmospherics and particulate and holy cow, not to mention the fact that we're going to put apertures on platforms that traditionally can't have really big apertures on. The Tomcat of old with massive dishes are kind of a thing of the past. And if you start talking about the infrared spectrum, optics and things, are fairly significant limitations. Assuming all this could be overcome, there's a lot of false targets, right? There's a lot of opportunity for an infrared search and track and Earth to glob onto something that's well beyond any sort of employment range you can, you can imagine. And now you got to do a bunch of math to figure it out. It takes more than one airplane and, you know, and it gets complicated. Now you got to have networks that airplanes can talk to each other at a very high rate of speed to compare a whole lot of lines of bearing and 
to try to get to the solution space. And, you know, holy cow, you got more company. And oh, by the way, while I'm doing that and I'm talking to each other, I'm emitting and holy cow, the, yeah. the autonomous fighter employment world, you know, is starting to look like, has it gotten too hard? Can we overcome the challenges? Now, there's a lot of stuff going on to help. And I don't want to deny the fact that directional networks and antennas and, you know, so there's a lot of goodness that can be had. But the way that we win is joint, integrated, and I don't mean across services, I mean across all agencies, across Title 10 and Title 50. So in the future, the way we win is we take all of our good stuff and we put it together. Yeah. Right. There should be a cloud of composite tracks, right? We really need to embrace the gig, right? We got to embrace the opportunity to be a part of a much larger set of contributors that are going with the right algorithms and the right math and all. And there's huge quantum leaps being made in computing and large data analytics and AI and all that stuff that you bring all that stuff together to give you a track that magically shows up in your cockpit. My brain's going down all kinds of different avenues as you're talking. We're talking about engine technology to get the altitude and speed you need, but to not develop the IR signature that, you know, we want to minimize IR signature. You talked about the Tomcat with its AUG9 antenna, which was awesome, but now we've got to collapse radar cross-section so you can't put a bunch of stuff out there to increase your radar cross-section. And then you're talking about, basically, we danced around manned unmanned teaming and using those autonomous vehicles linked to a human in a fighter. And now you're dealing with all this information coming in that you're trying to assimilate in a combat environment and make decisions. So now we need the compute power. We need the artificial intelligence machine learning to make that solution set, that processing easier so that we can still have a person making decisions. We don't want to relinquish that responsibility solely to the machines. That's an awesome commentary because you hit them all. And the last part is the most important. So the trust and confidence the, the human that's held accountable when we employ weapons, right? So traditionally, we have an entire command and control structure and how do you do that? And the E2 has a part, you know, in the future fight and E2 in its, in its current configuration, it, it potentially is not even a player, right? So you start, how do we do the command and control? How do we trust the robots are telling us the truth? And how do I trust my little buddy? So, you know, we're going to have to have a little buddy and, you know, a little Jarvis or whatever, that's going to help us with the AI to assimilate all this information, uh, to sort through what's critical and what's not, to help us make courses of action decision and present the data in such a way that it's consumable, right? All of that stuff is the tech, if you will, that we need the growth in, right? We can build engines, we can build rocket motors, we can build a long range missile, right? If we choose to, if we choose to invest and we choose to take a chance it's probably going to be very expensive. It's going to be somewhat exotic. It may not be able to service all target sets and so on, but you know, it can be done. Hmm. We can build a fast airplane. We can build a stealthy airplane. We can build an airplane that pulls a lot of G's or doesn't pull it, you know, all that sort of stuff. But all this big data networking, a seamless cloud employed kind of kill chain with a lot of robots helping you out is the future. Mm-hmm. That's for me what it is in a nutshell. And since you mentioned the robots, the mum T, I call them robots because my buddies would do more name dropping. So if you're <laughs> up at the Pentagon, who was the N98 special programs, now moved up to be the deputy 9SP guy. And uh, he loves to call them robots. All your little flying robot buddies were in the decision space of expendable or attritable or mm. horrible, right? things you don't care about so much or things you care some about or things that they always need to come home. And MQ-25 is a thing that has to come home. It's an expensive tanker for now and whatever it is in the future. So I can't afford to throw that thing away. But there's a lot of work going on. It's actually in a lot of open literature right now about how to make a low cost to try to bolt, right? The Air Force did an entire AOA about LCATs. What's that AOA? analysis of alternatives, right? Mm-hmm. So you go out and uh, you look at what's in industry, they bring forth a bunch of submissions and you do a bunch of analysis, analytics on it and kind of figure out the best of the best of those different trades, but usually you end up with a sort of a continuum of trade space. And in the LCAT world, 
There are proposals out there that suggest I can build an airplane that goes a thousand miles. I mean, you can look this up on the internet. It costs uh, three million bucks, hmm. and it's uh, compatible with a subsonic fighter, right? It's probably not a supersonic cruise kind of thing, but it can run around at 0.9 Mach and go a thousand miles, and it has carriage capabilities. So that's on one end of the spectrum. So we might call that an attributable. Mm-hmm. If it gets shot down, maybe I don't care. Maybe if I build it in the right way and it's connected in the right way and it's sharing all this data in the right way and it has sensors that can help me fill in the gaps when I don't have all the sort of exquisite kinds of things available to me, maybe that's a a proper use. I won't address um, weapons on the guy for a number of reasons. One is uh, security and one is uh, policy, right? Talking about putting weapons on those kind of aircraft gets a little politically sensitive, I think. I'll give you my opinion. If I can take an inferior weapon and through the application of an attributable aircraft, make it now either on par or have an advantage, that package, that kill chain becomes more effective to me Mm -hmm. and uh, potentially less expensive than the more exquisite option. Mm -hmm. The way you're describing it, I'm thinking of flying over Afghanistan and there's Predator there in the stack. You know, yes, it's an unmanned platform. It has weapon on it, it has a hellfire. There's still a person controlling whether that weapon's being launched or not. So, I mean, it's something that we're already doing, but just in a different application. You brought up MQ-25 and obviously that's still an emerging platform and developing And it makes me think about two different aspects of the carrier strike group problem of the future. One is the defensive aspect. So the MQ-25, you know, refueling tanker, ISR platform. I saw the Naval Aviation Vision 2030 or whatever is talking about comm relay. So lots of things that you can do with an unmanned platform that can fly around for 12 hours around the ship or whatever it is. But when we look at defending the strike group, still going to have your cruisers out there, you know, whether it's the DDG-1000 or a Ticonderoga high number cruiser and you got your submarine threat and all that kind of stuff going on. And we're going to try to stay up in the air, but you got that complex problem. But these manned strike fighter aircraft are also presumably going to be doing DCA, defensive counter air, protecting the aircraft carrier and the strike group. And then the next cycle, maybe go out into that environment of power projection ashore. So there's a two bigger problem sets, the defensive problem for the strike group, and then the offensive problem. Right. You know, at some point in a contested environment, they start to look very similar. The traditional DCA and OCA of the past, the lines are getting really blurred, actually, because it turns out, as an example, in some cases, the compromise to my sanctuary, right, is because the threat is exploiting me with a critical node. That critical node, potentially, I can take out. That looks like an offensive action. But to take it out puts me in a better defensive posture Mm -hmm. because all of my technology now is back where it was relative to the fight. So I can take advantage of all of my investments when I can sort of take down these critical nodes. But that requires a very offensive-looking OCA-like mission and very high risk, you know. You know, I didn't mention the when CAG-2 went through the training, and this made me really sad to watch a bunch of Navy lieutenants, lieutenant commanders, doing their best work, all patch wearing, hard charging. I mean, they know their numbers. They're on top of their game as best they can possibly be. And they're on the third iteration of, you know, a drag to defend, pump mindset for either fuel or threat. They have to turn hot. And they say on the radio, I don't remember, I guess the code can phrase can be whatever you want it to be, but they're basically going to allowable risk emergency is what they call it, which means mm-hmm. I'm not going home today. That's it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to a gas flame out or I'm going to shut down. Yeah. So that's what man platforms today. We talked about the kinetic weapons, missiles. We talked about developing a tritable unmanned aircraft in the MUMT. And you mentioned the $3 million, hey, subsonic. In my mind, I'm thinking, hey, that's all fine and dandy. But if you lose all of them on day one, you know, it's not like you got a whole bunch of space on the carrier to have missiles and things. So that's another challenge of, I think you alluded to building platforms that 
yeah, they're attritable, but we need them to be survivable because yes, it's better to lose one of those than a man platform that's more expensive. However, it's not like we've got a uh, unrestricted supply of this stuff out there on the sea. No, that's true. So those that are listening have probably read the literature, but one of the proposals is a 60-40 split where 60 is unmanned. The platform that would serve that role is probably going to be more survivable. It's probably not going to be a $3 million sort of throwaway. It's going to be something that we want to get back. And it's going to be something that will have a modular sort of capability, right? On one day, maybe it's uh, this kind of sensor. And on another day, maybe it's this kind of sensor. And you mentioned the comms relay, and that's huge because having something that's reconfigurable that allows me to tailor it by mission, by scenario, by tax it, by whatever, that's powerful because oftentimes being a relay. So, you know, in the future, F-35, there's a metal and F-16 to some extent, or Link-16 rather, for networks and stuff, and then some other proposals. But, you know, let's say we're all kind of limited to the network that I have today, whatever that is. Maybe in the future, we actually get to an advanced tactical link, but having a comms relay that can suck things down from SATCOM and stuff allows us to be more effective without sort of transmitting from the ship and mm. and all that sort of stuff. So you're right. There's something in the middle that depending on your appetite is a tradable or not, it costs more than that sort of minimal viable 3 million kind of benchmark, but the modularity and survivability potentially make you much more lethal. So there's a whole lot of analysis going on right now for that. And mm-hmm. that's happening in Navair, and it's happening uh, up at Wright Pat. It's not formal AOA stuff, but they are actually out trying to look at where is the knee in the curve, right? If we're going to spend this much, is it a bias this much? Does it work with the current weapons inventory, or is it you know the next generation, or is it a JATAM weapon, or whatever the next thing is? We're looking at all that, and in the end, it kind of turns into math. Yeah, math and risk decisions and, you know, resourcing decisions. Yeah. One of the things that we haven't mentioned in protecting both strikers and the strike group is the growler, which I think the Naval Aviation Vision has it going into the 2040s. But you got any just top level insight on that airborne electronic attack? Yeah, yeah. So growler, I'm also part of the global community. So in Pack Fleet, they run these war games. They're called Global is the name of the title of games you do with Naval War College. They're uh, fully informed, multi-level security. So it's pretty awesome. You get to go in and actually know about all the joint capabilities in theater. And the Growler plays a key role in every single fight tonight scenario. It's actually oversubscribed, right? So we run out of Growlers before we run out of missions. Mm -hmm. Now that said, its role somewhat has changed. So when I was fighting an F-18 on my first tour. We, we didn't have growlers, we had prowlers. And prowlers would basically make a nice big dent in the threat radar or IAD system so that I could run in there, employ weapons with autonomy and run out and hopefully never get shot at. And that worked great. We all grew up living that dream. Now at the range of the systems and the range of the sensors and the range of the weapons and all that sort of, that traditional standoff jamming thing. I mean, the growlers just can't get close enough to make it effective and and still survive on top of the air threat and everything else that's going on. Holy cow. So, Mm. but the growler community has pivoted quite well. So we start thinking about digital payloads, cyber, when I said critical nodes, somewhat alluding to either a kinetic option or a non-kinetic option. So there are a lot of opportunities that growler with even most recent advancements like bat wing antennas and things. So very quickly taking older technology and ALQ-99 pod and upgrading it, you get a major upgrade, like a two generation upgrade in one, Mm -hmm. uh, adding in a government basically procured and developed antenna. That's cool. Yeah. Next gen jammers coming online. That program has been riddled with all sorts of nonsense, but Hopefully it'll come out of the chocks and do all that they claim it can do. So I have a lot of faith that electronic warfare is here forever. It doesn't go anywhere. And if the growler's not providing that mission capability in 2040, one of these little buddies is. 
Mm-hmm. And when I said modular, I was somewhat implying that on this given day, maybe communications are important to me. And maybe I'll configure the little buddy to be effective against communications. Or maybe this day it's uh, airborne radars or whatever, sort of pick your flavor. If I have the ability to quickly move to different transceivers or potentially even apertures, depending on the kind of payloads and stuff, then I can start going after all those critical nodes, either with the growler or my little buddy. Which is, like you said, a testament to the community to see what the challenges are of the future and adapt. And especially when you got a platform like the Growler and the LQ99 and Next Gen Jammer, that it's modular. So we can make updates. We can keep it viable as an important quarterback in the mission. You know, and again, the vision talks about even F-35s hosting some of the capability, but it's all networked and you got somebody running it up there. It's a tie-in to one of our listener questions. Joe Kunzler asked about, you know, is the Growler going to be around till 2050s and therefore are we going to need to do FCLPs? We still got to land on the boat. I'm going to hopefully be doing a, an episode about PLM and, and how uh, and the precision landing mode and how that's evolving, how we're doing the actual admin of landing on the boat and such. Oh, yeah. The JOs these days, Magic Carpet is the savior, right? They, yeah. they don't even talk about FCLPs, right? They just go to the boat. <laughs> We're still out there doing FCLPs, but we'll see how that evolves out there. Uh, certainly, Magic Carpet has made some changes there. Let me uh, just kind of hit you up on a few other listener questions here. Okay. So Nick Forster, he was a Tornado G4 pilot, now flying the 787. He asked, how much live flying training versus synthetic do you envisage being carried out in the 2040s? That is actually a really good question because a lot of these, uh, this high-end netted cloud, you know, fuse source, long range, short range weapons, attributables, all those kinds of things. How the heck do you train to that? Mm -hmm. Even if you had the range and the space and all the assets and all of that, when you start to get to a a cloud level, there's way more participants, right? What does unit level training break down to? It's no longer just a section. There has to be all these other things that go with it. So how do you train to it? And would you want to train in a live environment anyway? Mm Mm-hmm. Right, because that's opportunity for the other guy to kind of figure out what you're up to. So, man, I don't know what unit level training looks like in the future. What does proficiency flying look like? I think we're going to spend a lot of time in simulated environments to exercise all of this high end capability. I don't see how we can get away from it. Yeah, I mean, we're doing live virtual constructive training, but. Pretty soon, it's going to be heavy on the V and the C and not so much on the L. I mean, you still got to know how to fly formation and fly through the clouds and not run into weather and not kill each other on the way back to the ship. I mean, Magic Carpet, you know, handles you the know, last 17 seconds in a group. But, That's right. You know, it doesn't get you to the overhead in a four ship, right? Or maybe we just completely change the paradigm. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Maybe a next generation aircraft, sort of this autonomous acting vehicle, they never fly in formation. Well, I don't know. Well, it's almost like what I started referring to the F-35, but I think the uh, FAXX will truly be the single-seat Wizzo cockpit. (laughs) you got a computerized chauffeur taking you around, and you're making decisions. You laugh. There's a version of that where there's no out-the-front vision. Yeah. There's no canopy out the front. There's some cameras and stuff in case you need to look out the front. But you are effectively managing the systems while the aircraft's flying you where you need to go. Mm Mm-hmm. And so Top Gun came because we couldn't dogfight and the whole gun in the dogfight. And so Jeff Price asked, are we looking at platforms without guns in the future? You know, the whole visual arena thing is something that I'm still struggling with. If everything goes to hell in a hand pass, right? So there's a war in space that basically there's a whole mutual assured destruction, right? If you kill one thing and Leo then the debris field potentially starts to destroy other LEO satellites. and Low Earth orbit. Low Earth orbit. You know, so at some point, there's an entire debris field at 300 nautical miles from the Earth that you can't go through. And eventually the satellites age out or whatever. Or maybe there's a huge fight that happens at higher altitudes or higher orbits and everything in the space is denied, right? So there's no SATCOM, there's no GPS, there's no, you know, there's sort of this dark ages version of this thing. Heaven forbid that we get into that kind of World War III. Well, so if you end up there, don't we sort of end up back to the point where we might be going to merges and there might be some turn-in that happens? And yeah, there's a version of the story that looks like that. Mm -hmm. 
I think the planning is to avoid that at all costs. Uh, that doesn't deny the need for close air support or, you know, is the war on terror kind of past potentially repeatable in the future? Well, I would assume so. I don't know that we ever get out of that business, but purely for the high end fight, I can say that we're not planning in visual engagements. Mm -hmm. If you survived, the assumption is the threat doesn't have any problem with shooting anything that's in front of it because it's not limited in inventory and it doesn't really care who that guy is. Mm. It's not trying to make sure that it gets the right weapon target pair and those kinds of things. It's just going to waylay. So if you made it through all of that and got to a point that there was a moment of confusion and which way do they go, goose? <laughs> then, you know, maybe so. But sadly, I don't know that I can say that in what I've seen for an NJET, I haven't seen a gun. But mm -hmm. Hopefully we're going to do an FAXX uh, conversation and, and we'll hit that one up again. Jevin Diva, he asked, how do you envisage a carrier battle group protecting itself against the threat of hypersonic weapons? And will the solution involve carrier-launched aircraft and their little wingman drones, the MUMT, uh, directed energy weapons, all that kind of... I think all that stuff's on the table for, I think, from hypersonics, especially the directed energy weapons. Yeah, so interesting enough, you know, directed energy... Um, so they built a DDG-1000 with enough power generation capability to basically power a, a city the size of Huntsville. It makes a lot of power, and it was intended for a railgun or a directed energy weapon and things. So, And we have some stuff on the shelf that you can read up. You can look it up in uh, Aviation Week or whatever that are potentially very capable systems. Now, there's stability and, you know, in ships, motion, and, you know, it gets a, a little bit complicated, but I don't think we're that far away when it comes to that technology. I always say that until recently, the Pentagon didn't have an appetite for it. It just wasn't making cut lines. But holy cow, is that the last line of defense? We're talking about the knife fight at this point, because that directed energy, when we're talking about lasers, is going to be very much in the end game, right? This is it, right? See whiz kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's really scary. Yeah. And the number of targets you might have to serve is, is even more frightening. So I would say that the game plan, if there is one, would be for integrated missile defense is to, first of all, to hide, right? If they can't get a good fix on you, then it's hard for them to shoot you, right? So do the best you can to hide or deceive or deny or degrade, you know, those kind of standard war fighting 101, right? They don't know where I am, or they don't know with enough accuracy, or they think I'm someplace else, then everything's working into my advantage. Now, if it all falls apart, step one, to get back to that place, if I lost it, I can, let's get that back, right? Let's get back into hiding, however that happens to happen. But if I got to shoot at stuff, I would argue that you want to kill these hypersonic or glide or whatever before they come a problem that you can't deal with. So before Apogee on ascent and stuff like that. So the more that we can develop to position ourselves to shoot those guys down on ascent. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about a really short OODA loop. Yeah. Holy cow. Very quick decision making. You got to have stuff in theater, ready to go, pre postured, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. This sort of, I'm going to shoot the vampires as they're coming in. Old world is hard. Now, mm -hmm. that said, there's a whole world of, okay, they shot at me and all hell is breaking loose. At least I got a laser, or I have a, a real gun, or I have a, you know, even a standard missile, right? Our options in here. But in the end game, there's a lot of stuff we're thinking about. That's like bizarre-ish, right? So um, a hypersonic weapon is going very fast, but it turns out it's really, really hot, right? It's probably barely kind of staying together. So its material integrity is somewhat suspect. So it doesn't take much, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody that's shot a rifle as a hunter, if you hit a blade of grass or you hit a twig on a, a limb on a tree or something, you know, you just missed your shot. That kind of thinking is out there, right? So are there expendables or there, you throw a bunch of cylinders in the air, uh, you know, BBs, large BB, you know, it gets it's kind of weird. You start thinking about Got it. People shooting shotguns off the off ship. Your, your shotgun, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's a whole lot of thought behind that. But I would say in those areas, if there's actual work being done, I don't know about it. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Yeah, it's something I figured out long ago that, you know, with every challenge out there, we got some smart people working on it. Yeah. 
Sean Jones asked about UCAVs be a massive multiplier from the Navy. We kind of talked about the uh, man-on-man teaming, but in the end, his bottom line question, is the Navy going to get left behind? Doesn't seem like it, but I mean, we're always working. Again, a great question because in these global games and these other places where we're playing a joint fight, even inside of that, we have some service friction. Mm -hmm. I got it covered on the Air Force. This is what I do. I got it covered on the Navy. This is what I do. But the one thing that you can never debate is that a rapidly relocatable airfield is always advantageous until it gets sunk. Mm -hmm. But when you can move your aircraft where you want, it makes it a really hard target. When you can't move your runway, it becomes somewhat of a very easy, predictable target, right? Back in the day when you and I would plan strikes, oh, we're going to bomb a runway today. We'll get the, whew, that was easy. The dippy got really simple. I don't even have to freaking ID that thing, right? It's GPS and go. So that said, obviously the Air Force and the kind of money they might throw at this can likely produce quite a few more robots out of the chocks than a Navy contingent. Do they know how to operate those in um expeditionary way, question mark. Mm -hmm. I'd say the Marine Corps would know how. Everything the Marine Corps has done has completely shifted to expeditionary operations, So, which would include a lot of these little buddies. So maybe the question is, where do they go? Are they on the carrier? Are they on a, an airfield in the jungle run by a bunch of Marines? Is it an expeditionary Air Force group? How do you go? Because there, you know, there's only so much range. Yeah. Even though they could probably aerial refuel and all these sorts of things, they're not going to go forever. And the closer you get to the front line, the harder your logistics problem becomes. And yeah. Now, one of the more interesting concepts is what if we did stop thinking about it that way? But what if my mothership, if you will, is an Air Force platform that can survive at range or whatever and has all the connectivity that I really want? And what if the, the Navy launches the little buddies and the Air Force mothership is actually in charge of what's going on for this particular fight, mm -hmm. right? And then on another day, it's an F-35 with four loyal wingmen. And to create that kind of seamless architecture would be freaking awesome because then I don't care. Yeah. Then it doesn't really matter, right? So now flip that around, a bunch of Air Force little robots show up and they join my four loyal wingmen with my F-35 and my NJAD, and that becomes a lethal, minimal fighting unit. So now it's a great possible future. James Logue, he's from the FAA fast team representative. So uh, interesting that he brings in what kind of adjustments to support systems and infrastructure do you think will be made between now and 2040? The way he asked the question, I'm kind of thinking, first of all, we got unmanned aircraft flying around the national airspace system. So we're still got work to do there. And then we talked about ranges earlier when we're dealing with these high altitude, big fights, we're already having range issues with the amount of range space we have to train. So a lot more on the virtual constructive and probably less so in the live. But any other thoughts on that one? I think we kind of talked about it. Yeah, I think the see and avoid uh, you know, rules of the road, traditional approach that you and I grew up with are going to start getting a little weird. Mm. Some of the avoidance system, TCAS, you know, if you got a bunch of robots flying around, you know, at what point do we trust them enough? I can say that even today, if you launch a Predator, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on just to get that sucker out on a range if it has to transit someplace to get there. So, but fortunately, we got industry out there with companies like Zipline and all these other ones that are doing drone delivery that are really pushing the FA on that autonomous vehicle part of the airspace structure. So it's not just us fighting that fight. It's likely not a military problem per se. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, United States problem. The range thing is a very interesting question. Uh, you know, we've looked at how to expand ranges, um, how to merge ranges, how to, to take an entire Nellis range and merge it with a China Lake 2508 range and the sea range and, have sort of this seamless fight that goes on right now. Holy cow, that just turned into whatever, a thousand miles and, and change. So could you do that? Or do you have to go to Alaska every year? Mm -hmm. We've tried the Hawaii option and it turns out it's not even e any easier in Hawaii because there's a lot of airline traffic and stuff. So it's a great question. Yep. 
Man, we could go on and on about this stuff, but we have hit a lot of top-level things. I think it's a great episode to kind of frame future episodes for fighting in the future and the challenges and the platforms and the people, most importantly, the people like yourself. So we got reconnected through the writer's room. Can you talk real quick about the kind of work you guys are doing to influence decision makers through graphic novel? Yeah, so Rick Arthur, uh, Navy captain, uh, reservist, who's also a TV showrunner, writer. He wrote for NCIS, Last Ship. You can check him out on IMDb. So Rick asked me to be a part of what he called the Fleet Writers Room. And the idea was, uh, could we basically take the approach that we had in TV writing, um, similar approach to TV writing, where we bring in all the experts and we crunch and we crank out a story in that kind of environment. So our charter was to come up with a, or develop, write, and produce a graphic novel. It's a fancy way of saying comic book, just more pages. <laughs> and uh, the graphic novel is about a conflict with China in 2041 to 2043 timeframe. How would we take future technologies and use them in a fight like that, including all the stuff that we just talked about, direct energy, hypersonics, and so on? And how would the warfighter of the future interface with those technologies? That is a backdrop. We built an entire story, scenario, characters, development, all that stuff. And we've got heroes and villains, and you know, it's pretty cool. The sponsor, NOCWD, Naval Air Weapons Center, China Lake, or Weapons Division. Warfare Center Weapons Division. That group, who I actually work for, wanted to use that product to inform the workforce. So all the engineers, PhDs, you know, chemists and everything. What is it that you're doing? How does it matter? And these future technologies that you're working on, how do they fit? So that was it. That sort of morphed into a film opportunity. So we're creating a, about an eight to nine minute Hollywood quality motion picture based around the story and these technologies that we're going to put on film. And that'll be used by NOCWD and NIWIC PAC. Naval Information Warfare Center uh, Pacific and um, for VIPs uh, and workforce development, that information exchange kind of thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's neat because previously we talked about influencing decision makers as we go through resourcing and, but also what a great use of that to inform the workforce, the importance of what everybody's doing, trying to develop these things. So it's a great use of that. Yeah, so the decision maker part has been interesting. We've been out, you know, sort of peddling our goods. We have issue one and we've shown it to people because we're very excited about it. We're like, wow, this turned out way better than I thought. Mm. And uh, you show it to a few people and we've got a lot of interest at the Pentagon level for storytelling, right? How do I, oh, and ours, like maybe this is the way we talk about our stories because it seems we can't get things through the valley of death. And maybe if I had a better context, it would sell better or you know, people would understand. And in 98, they're very excited to share the product to talk about how the man on man teaming might fit in the future. And, you know, by the way, here's a fun read to see what it looks like. You know, it's based on truth. It's fiction, but based on truth. So. Based on informed truth. Awesome. Really great stuff, Pink. You mentioned earlier that you're in Huntsville, Alabama. So what's the future hold for you? Uh, what are you taking with your big thoughts? It's been a lot of fun here in Huntsville. I've got to work with the high altitude balloon guys, and stratospheric balloons and sensors. You know, there's a lot of work happening, you know, outside of this little conversation that we've had. And in the process of doing that and working the unmanned thing, I ran across a company called Andrel, started by Lucky Palmer. You can look him up, listen to his videos. Unbeknownst to me, my name was put in a hat as a potential subject matter expert and product development lead for their company. So uh, I entertained an offer and I accepted uh, just today, actually. And uh, All right. just to see where that goes. When you've done this long enough, well, I invested in the government, you know, I, I'll get a retirement, whatever. When you're not so worried about your future or you just don't care. When you've been talking about things that are broken for a long time, it seems, perspective is everything, but it seems from my perspective that it's been a hard road. We just haven't made the progress that I think we could. I briefed admirals about gaps. And when I get really snarky, I'm like, what are you? I'm going to give you the same brief that I gave the other guy five years ago, or do you want the one I gave the guy before him 10 years ago? At some point that gets a little old. 
not to be negative against anything that we're doing or trying to do, because there are some people that really are trying to make a change. But I wanted to make a stab at um, working outside of that circle, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if I was working with an industry partner that potentially wants to deliver a turnkey kill chain end to end, and you can look them up online, they're doing some pretty cool stuff. I'm anxious to be a part of that. And, you know, who knows, maybe next time we talk, there might be a really cool widget that's coming out. So Yeah, who knows? And, you know, I, I just spoke recently to the Pacific Northwest Defense Coalition about the people in the defense industrial base. And everybody's out there trying to do the best thing for our warfighters today and tomorrow. And everybody's got to deal with uh, resource challenges and stuff as we make our way through that. But, you know, it's good to hear you're taking advantage of that opportunity and you're still on the same team trying to do good things. So the graphic novel is 2041 to 2043. So that's basically 20 years from now. 20 years from now, we'll get back together and do part two of this <laughs> so we can look back and see how we did. Well, if I look as far as Tom Cruise at 60, whatever he is, <laughs> uh, then I'm up for the challenge. Yeah, well, this is audio only. So, uh, well, who knows what it will be 20 years from now. It'll be holograms or whatever. So. <laughs> Hey, Pink, it has been really great having you on here. I really appreciate it. Uh, just a, a wealth, a depth of knowledge that touches all these great interest areas. And I know that this conversation is going to take us on multiple paths in future episodes. So I really appreciate you setting the scene what, with what air combat you know, is probably going to look like in the 2040s and the challenges and the things that good people are out there trying to solve. Yeah, thanks, Flounder. That's a good way to end it because uh, it's easy to get negative. When you start talking about the future and, and how we're just not keeping up and to get cynical, I want to say that in the career that I've had and all of the work that I've done, there are so many people that are really trying hard to make a difference. And there are so many people that have some really good ideas. When you're not confronted with the you know traditional fiscal limitations and uh, we don't have a requirement kind of rhetoric, you're going to find that there are a lot of people working hard. And I think this podcast is one of those entities that's trying hard to inform a wider audience so that there's some understanding. Sometimes just a little change in culture, all the difference. So. That's right. Awesome, Pink. Hey, uh, good luck to you. We'll stay in touch, and uh, but good to see you today. Thanks a lot for your time. All right, thanks. All right. Flounder, nice job on your first interview. And thanks to both you and Pink for making it happen. Man, there was a lot to unpack in that. But first off, I thought it was brave of him to own up to and talk about his DUI. I remember those being a big deal and they still are, I'm sure. But man, they were really career killers at the time. Yeah, that's right. When it came in the episode, you know, he's riding the high of all this great stuff he's been doing. And then mm -hmm. the DUI comes. I'm going to date myself. I went back to those VH1 episodes where they talk about the band, all the great thing these bands are doing, and all of a sudden the music changes as things fall apart. Yeah. I talked to him afterwards about it, and he's got a, such a great attitude about it. He's like, you know, this thing happened. I had to embrace it, and it really allowed him to see the opportunities that were out there, and he's really done a lot with it. That's more to his nature of being an engineer, working hard behind the scenes. He looks back, and he's really happy with his life. Well, that's good. Obviously, I don't think anyone would ever want that, but without the risk of getting a little philosophical, right? I mean, everything works out, hopefully, the way it's supposed to. Boy, I couldn't help but think, but for the grace of God, there go I, because certainly yeah. uh, I don't want to sit and extol all my poor virtues in the past, but I know I've had one or two before and thought I was fine to go home and gladly made it, but who knows if I'd have been tested. But at any rate, good on him for that. Let's see. At some point, you mentioned the CCIP bombing mode, and I think you got the first C wrong, if I remember correctly. It's constantly computed impact point. I'll tell you, that wasn't a method a lot of people used, but I liked it because if you could figure out the trend, you could put the dot on the target, push the button at that moment, and see your results right away. So, yeah, I thought it was cool. Yeah, and the Tomcat, I think we had CCIP and CCRP, R being release point. I know a lot of the preferences of my pilots was CCIP. Yeah. When you had a tight system, it was a good solution. But I'll tell you, acronyms, so many acronyms, it's like, I know what that means, but I don't remember the exact words. And yeah. so uh, it's always good to have squadron mates out there, shipmates out there, double checking us. 
Hey, look, man, everyone who's listened to the 148 preceding episodes can tell you that I get it wrong when I turn on the microphone. Something about hitting the record switch makes me half as smart and I'm already at a deficit. So I get it wrong all the time. But what I tell people is, hey, we're going to come back and fix it because, you know, authenticity is important, but so are the facts. So yeah, we'll cover that. No big deal. That's right. But the CCRP, I think in the F-18 was basically like the auto, right? Yeah. Okay. I always use CCIP as a parent mode because as soon as you designate the target, then you have auto. But if you undesignate, then you have a hot pickle, which can be a liability if you're not careful. But I always like CCIP as the uh, parent mode for dropping. So yeah, we covered that one. And then I can't remember, did you ever do a Japan tour? Because I did. Leading up to it, man, my wife also resisted going. But once she got there, she loved it. And she and the kids have been talking about going back ever since. And I'm like, well, I'm out of the Navy. I don't know how we're going to figure that one out, but we can go visit. Yeah, that's right. Well, I actually did look for the opportunity, but a lot of people I know who are going there, same thing, resisting it and ended up loving it. I visited when I was at VX9. We did some trips out there to talk about new stuff coming for the squadron that was out there. And I did some port calls and also did Operation Tomodachi, which was the tsunami relief effort out there. And so I would absolutely look forward to living over there. And I had to chuckle at the theme that I heard as he talked about his <laughs> trip out there. Well, getting there and getting home is a pain, but once you're there, it's great. And again, it's just, especially when you have young kids for them to see something different than American culture and how it's just such a different culture and they're not as litigious, but they're also more polite and shame is like a, almost a virtue in a sense. It, it was really unique. You know, I was only there a little over a year For people who stay three years, I guess they're ready to come home. But, you know, one and a half to two years apparently is perfect for most of us. So That's right. We had a similar experience when we went to Sweden. We went there for two years. So the logistics, like you said, of getting there, especially with a one and a half and a three and a half year old and getting back, it's painful. But the experience there and the, the places you travel from a place like that, you're already outside the country. So it's so much easier to go see a lot of stuff. So it is a great opportunity to get outside the U.S. and live somewhere else. So as I think about the meat of your discussion with Pink Flounder, it was interesting, but it's hard to, I guess, say, well, let's drill down on this or let's drill down on that because a lot of it was conceptual, but I liked what he talked about as far as man in the loop or speed, right? And some of the thoughts that we have going forward. But I guess to your point earlier, maybe the reason I've avoided this, and I'm not suggesting that you're wrong for coming to the show and doing it, it's needed, but I just feel a little like, uneasy afterwards because while you guys had a great conversation, it's hard really for me to say, okay, here's the three or four takeaways, or here's what I know about, you know, at one point we were going to call this naval aviation in the 2040s and we decided to call it the future of air warfare. But we think we have some ideas, but in the end, no one knows the future. That's right. And as you said earlier in the intro to it, that we have great technologies, F-35 and F-22 to fight the fight today, but what's it going to look like in the future? And at least we have to go through the exercise of considering this stuff and simulating and all those kinds of things. So we as a defense industry, you know, the DOD and everybody can try to stay ahead in the technologies, try to stay ahead in the tactics. Uh, You know, I love the message at the end. There's a lot of passionate people out there, whether they're government civilians or folks in the defense companies or active duty who are really working to do that so we can maintain that edge in a very competitive strategic situation. Well, and I'm glad he said that because, you know, I get a lot of questions on this show about, well, why don't they do this? Or how come nobody ever thought of that? And my answer, and maybe it's a bit of a cop-out, but I always say, you know what, I take it on faith that there are smart people out there looking at all these different things. And if it was viable, we'd probably be doing it or have it or whatever the case is. That's right. And the fact that we don't tells you something. But like I said, it's maybe a bit of a cop-out because I just don't know. But it sounds like Pink does, and so we'll have to include him in our Rolodex of resources because we sometimes reach back to past guests. But he really seems like he's got a wealth of information. He sure does. It was a great conversation. And like I said, a lot of great ways we can go with it to see what may come out of future episodes. No doubt. Well, so he had mentioned during your interview, and your interview has been a little while ago, that he was starting a new position. So have you chatted with him since? Any updates on his new gig? So yeah, we did talk about that in a follow-up. He is going to start with Anderil just after this episode airs. He's going to start on the 8th of August. All right. He retired from government service. He said, I've worked for the government since AOCS, the Aviation Officer Candidate School in 1987. I was an AVROC. I wasn't familiar with that one, but 
35 years, give or take, worked for a CSS contractor for two years after the Navy, but has been doing government work that whole time. Ed Andero, he's going to be a director for Kill Change, Weapons, and MUMT, Manned Unmanned Teaming, appropriate given our interview. So mm-hmm. absolutely, he's going to be a great resource, a friend of the show that we'll be able to go back to. All right. But Flounder, I do have to bust your stones on one thing. And I can, okay, Lance Floyd, Pink, I can figure it out. But come on, man, it's fighter pilot podcast tradition to ask about call signs because maybe he had, you know, maybe he wanted to be like Spine Ripper or Assassin or something. But did you forget or just I didn't remind you probably? Well, yeah, I think I had it on my list, but I did neglect that one. So that's one below in a reply for me. (laughs) Yeah, he did tell me that in his call sign, it was pretty straightforward and unoriginal. He got it flying A4s in the training command. Yeah, They thought it was derogatory to call me pink. I didn't mind, but pretended like I did. Uh, Very good. Well, it's funny because when you first told me, hey, I've got this interview lined up with Pink Floyd, I said, wait, isn't there an Admiral Floyd? And I think his call sign was pink. I think that anybody who comes in, at least (laughs) maybe back a couple decades ago, but anybody who came in whose last name was Floyd is like, you're pink. Yeah. Yeah. So I've run across a couple other Pink Floyds too. Cool. All right, Flounder. Well, again, great discussion. We can begin wrapping up. We always do by announcing our newest Patreon supporters. We have a strike lead, Chad Holbrook, a mission commander, Richard Dropkin, and an air boss, which is the highest possible tier. That's Mark Eaton. And we're certainly thankful for the air bosses, but really for all of them who help make this show possible. In fact, I had my debrief with Mark and he said something I liked, Flounder. He goes, I noticed you don't bombard listeners with ads and different promotions like a lot of podcasts. So I thought I'd come over to Patreon and help you out. And I thought, well, that's really cool because, you know, once in a while, if we have something come along, we'll promote it. But I don't know about you, Flounder. I listen to some podcasts and you got to hit the fast forward button like 10 times when you first hit play. So that's right. We we try not to do that. No, that's good. And, And it's something I've enjoyed as a listener as well. Good. Well, the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So, Flounder, thanks again. Did you enjoy the process enough to want to do it again? And if so, what topics do you have up your sleeve? I absolutely enjoyed the process. I really appreciate the support as I kind of get into podcasting from the hosting side, joining the Fighter Pilot Podcast team. And it's been fun. I've listened to some of your early episodes recently, catching up on some things. And you were good to start with, but you've been a really great host, the Top Gun Podcasting. So it's great to learn from you. Like I said, a lot of great ways we can go down this. I'm trying to line up that episode on the precision landing mode and how that potentially could change how we operate around the ship. Mm -hmm. Of course, I want to get into NGAD, FAXX that we talked about, the next generation air dominance. MQ-25 is out there. There's some munitions, things that I think are interesting. And, you know, it'd be nice to do some historical stuff as well to help you out with that kind of content. And then the last thing I'll mention, you had a great episode with Maker on being an astronaut, I think I've got a guy lined up to talk about what it was like to fly the space shuttle. And he was involved in the development of the Crew Dragon and SpaceX stuff. So talking about kind of the future of piloting in that way too. And he was a Marine Corps F-18 guy. So we'll see if we can get that lined up. Epic. Well, I appreciate the compliment. When I go back and listen to early episodes, I cringe a little bit, but hey, it's been a steep learning curve and you don't know till you try. And then, yeah, thanks. Uh, In fact, we just had Maker back on a live zoom which is one of the perks some of our patreon tiers enjoy so yeah maker came back for 30 minutes told us what's going on in his world good dude and uh hopefully he's going to get back to space pretty soon certainly glad to have your help and you know we've got you we've got ken katz and we've got billy flynn so as long as you guys are deconflicting i kind of think of you as the you know ford leading edge stuff Ken is kind of the current engineering and geeky stuff. He loves it when I tease him about that. Billy Flynn's had an amazing experience, so we can do a lot of episodes based around his time in F-18s, F-16s, and he flew all kinds of cool stuff. And then one of these days, we're supposed to bring back Boat, who will do our Warbirds, but you can help him out as well. So yeah, we've got the spectrum covered, man. So thanks again. I thought you did a great job today. Thanks, Jello. Great to be a part of this great team. So I look forward to more. Cool. Well, we'll look forward to hearing more from you soon. As for everyone else, that will do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, and we'll see you next time. So long. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BBR Productions. Got a question for the show? 
email us at questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to follow us on your favorite social media platform and check out our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. For exclusive content and to help support the show, check out our Patreon page. Thanks for listening. Hi, my name is Catherine. I live in Los Angeles, California, and I'm a 45-year-old mom of three. I have seen Top Gun Maverick seven times in the theater, and it never gets less exciting for me. I wanted to be a fighter pilot ever since watching the first movie in 1986 when I was nine years old, but I decided to become a ballet dancer instead, and then I went to film school and ended up actually working as a personal assistant to Iceman, to Val Kilmer, for a little while. So I just wanted to say thank you for this podcast, because as a middle-aged mom of three, I don't have a lot of friends who share my love of fighter jets, and I don't have a lot of people who I can talk to about this kind of stuff. So this is just so much fun for me to listen to. It gives me a window into a world that I have loved for a very, very long time and have kind of always been on the outside looking in. So thank you for that. I look forward to every episode, and I'm really, really enjoying these few weeks of Top Gun episodes. And my husband, who I met in film school, is a high-speed photographer, and he just got a job working with the Blue Angels at the end of August in Florida. So that's also kind of an exciting little anecdote. All right. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work. Bye.